rather, 1x long, 2x long, 3x long, and so forth, and then you've got short, 1x short, 2x short. That shank length, incidentally, does not include the eye. That stays the same, or the bend. That stays the same regardless of the length of the shank. Your next consideration is hook size. That's the overall size of the hook. Now, when the numbers become larger, then the hook becomes smaller. So let's say that we have a size 4 or 6 hook. That's a large hook for a trout fly. Um, a medium size hook for a trout fly would be a 12 or 14. A small hook for a trout fly would be a 16 or an 18. And if you get into the very smallest hooks, then you have the very largest numbers. 24, 22, 26, those are really tiny trout fly hooks. Now the sizing, there is an inconsistency in the sizing, and that's when you get to the largest hooks. None of the ones that we will use in this videotape are that large, but it's still good for you to understand how it works. When you get down to size one, then the rules change. A larger hook than a size 1 is a size 1 aught. Then you have size 2 aught, then 3 aught, and then 4 aught. Now the numbers are getting larger as the hook gets larger. I know it's a little confusing, but most of the time you won't have to worry about that. Most of the time, big number, small hook. Finally, we have the wire of the hook. And this is important, because if the wire is heavy, that will help the fly to sink. But if you want the fly to float, you might, you probably, in fact, will want to get a wire that is light. The, uh, there is a standard wire for a certain size of hook, and this is called standard weight or standard wire. If the wire is finer than that, it's called light wire. If it's heavier, it's called heavier, heavy wire. And again, we go back to the X system. Now, the reason we use the X system for both the shank length and the wire is so that it's as confusing as possible. If you have a wire that is one increment lighter than normal, it is 1X light. If it's two increments lighter than normal, it's 2X light. If it's heavier than normal, same thing. 1X heavy, one increment, 2X heavy, two increments, 3X heavy, three increments, and so on. The heavy wire is for sinking flies, and again, the light wire is for the floating flies. Here are some of the lesser considerations in hooks. Now, this hook is a down eye, and that's because the eye of the hook tips down. A ring eye hook would be straight off the shank, neither tipping up nor down. And an up eye hook would be tipping up. You have two choices here. If the pattern calls for a down eye, you can just follow the pattern. If the pattern doesn't say, or if you have a personal preference, then use one of the other types. Uh, it really is not that important, and, and most fly fishers and fly tires just after time, they decide which hooks they like. It's not a big consideration, but be aware of it. The other thing is the bend. Now, this is probably even less important. There are several kinds of bends on hooks, and they're just slightly different shapes. Uh, I'm not going to go into all those. With time, you'll figure out what you like. It's not important. Don't worry about it a lot. All the bends that we use now are pretty much time proven, and they're good. Now, there are some inconsistencies that will throw you a bit. Uh, the thing to remember about inconsistencies is they're not that important. One manufacturer's size 8 4X long hook may be a little bit bigger, a little bit different than another manufacturer's size 8 4X long hook. It's probably not going to make any difference in the fly. Don't worry about it. If the hook looks about right, it's probably just fine. The other thing is that sometimes they won't follow the rules. They won't call a 4X long hook a 4X long hook. They may call it a bucktail streamer hook or something like that. Well, if they do that, then uh, you just, with time, you will learn these things. You'll learn that a bucktail takes about a 4X long hook, so it's probably a 4X long hook. Not a big deal, but just don't let it throw you. Another thing to look for are abbreviations. If you see T-U-E on your uh, hook description, it probably means turned up eye. That means an up eye hook. If you say, see a hook that's described as 4XS, which you rarely will, that's awfully short, but if you see one that says 4XS, it probably means 4X short, or 4XL, 
or x long, and so forth. So just watch for abbreviations. They're usually very logical and easy to figure out. If you understand these basic principles of, about hooks, uh, you'll do fine. These are the parts of a nymph, the first fly that we're going to tie. This is called the tail. This, is, this whole thing is called the body. But often we refer to this as the abdomen, this back half or back part of the fly. Sometimes it's less or more than half. These are ribs. This is the thorax. This is the front part of the fly, sort of the chest of the fly. This is a wing case, commonly used on nymphs, not always, but frequently. These are legs, which are tied in in a variety of ways. And this is called a thread head. You will see that on most of the flies that we tie. The first fly we're going to tie is Rick's caddis. This was created by my friend Rick Hayfley, and it imitates caddis larvae which live in the bottoms of streams and eventually swim to the surface and take wing and turn into caddisfly adults. But most of their lives, they spend down in that stream bed looking a lot like Rick's caddis. Uh, Rick is an entomologist, and, which is a, one who studies insects, so you can be sure that if it's a Rick Hayfley fly, it's a good convincing imitation of the real thing because he's spent a lot of time with the real thing. This is called a fly pattern. It may look a little odd to you now, but once you get used to fly patterns, it will become second nature to follow them. Basically, a fly pattern gives you the essential information you need in order to tie a fly. And in most cases, it gives you all the information you need in order to tie a fly. The things that are listed in a fly pattern from top to bottom are in the order in which they're called for to tie the fly, usually. But you can't always count on that because not everybody follows that rule. Well, enough fly tying trivia for now. Let's get started tying. The first thing you need is some thread. Now this is yellow thread. You'll be using brown, but I want to show you what I'm doing. Sometimes it's a little tricky to get the thread end loose from the spool. Uh, there are some tricks you can use. One is to look for one strand of thread that cuts at a steep angle across the others. When you find that, that is probably the last turn of thread. Go right up to where it hits the spool and then work it loose. It should come up into a notch, a little cut in the spool. Look for that cut, and you've also found the thread end. To get that thread end loose, you can take your closed scissor blades and work them down under that strand of thread, and then pop it out of the notch in the spool. Now we're going to put that into your bobbin, a thread bobbin. So. Put it in like this, and then take the end of your thread and push it up into the base of the bobbin tube. And there are a number of ways of getting that thread up through the tube, but the best one I know of, this is if you use your bobbin and nobody else does, is to do this and just suck it right through there with a blast of air. If you have trouble doing that, you can also use, this is my favorite tool for this, is a folded over piece of monofilament or leader material. And you just kind of crease that and then push it down through the tube. When you get it through the end, you put the end of the thread through the loop in the leader, like this, like you're threading a needle, and then pull the loop back through and the thread with it. Now, if your thread doesn't want to go through the tube, and this usually won't happen with a new bobbin, but it may happen after a while, that's probably because your thread has a light coating of wax, which is built up in the tube, especially down here at the base of the tube. Take some heavy monofilament or anything similar that will do the job, good, thick, stiff monofilament, push it down the tube, and then just push it through the end of the tube a few times, and it will clean out that wax. It'll push that buildup of wax out, and then you can thread the bobbin. Once you've got your bobbin threaded, you may find that the bobbin is either too stiff, too tight, that is, or that it's too loose. Now, you'll, find, you'll learn more about this as you tie. You have to sort of control the bobbin uh, by how tightly you clutch the thread in your fingers. 
but if the bobbin's too loose, you're going to find that the thread's always slipping off the bobbin and you've got too much thread. If you find that the bobbin is too tight, then you'll, you're going to constantly be having to support the hook and sort of pull it out of there trying not to break the thread. You want it somewhere in between there. If it's too tight or it's too loose, remove the thread and then bend the frame so that these knobs, these ends that fit into the ends of the spool are either out a little to loosen it or in tighter to tighten the thread. Don't bend this part of the frame where the tube is attached to these arms because if you put pressure on this it's likely to break the weld joint. Just grab onto here and two pairs of pliers is the best way to do it. One pair below this bend and one pair above the bend and then bend the frame however you see fit. You can also go down here and bend this part of the frame if you need to to make adjustments. And just do that on either side until you've got the bobbin just as tight or as loose as you want it. Again, you're going to find out more about that as you continue to tie because you'll, everybody has a little bit different preference in how tight their bobbin should be. You need a hook in order to tie a fly. This is not the hook that you'll be using for this fly, but it's a big hook, so I can show you what I'm doing. We're going to smash the barb on this hook. This is often done now, and most fly fishers do it. Some fly fishing only waters and other special uh, regulation waters require that you smash the barb on your hook. Uh, but most fly fishermen do it anyway because they don't want that barb tearing up the fish's mouth. Besides, there's some controversy as to whether a hook actually sinks better without the barb, and I'm leaning that way myself and you know, believing that. A pair of pliers, any kind that have a flat nose, are fine. Take your pliers, and I showed you before where the barb was, and you simply grab onto the hook where the barb is, and you press down. You tighten the pliers. Don't get exaggerated on this. Don't press very hard. Just get that barb to bend down. It'll, there'll still be a hump there. The point is you've got it down out of the way. If you really put the, the pressure on the pliers, you're likely to fracture that hook. So you've got your hook barb smashed. Your next step is going to be to put that hook into your vise. Now the thing with a fly tying vise, some people try to actually hide the barb of the hook, or the point rather, well, the barb and the point, in fact, with the jaws of the vise. I recommend very strongly against doing this. What it does is it greatly limits your access to the hook, and it makes it awkward to, to work. Other people will mount the hook in the vise so that it's just barely held in there with the idea that it gives a maximum access. But the problem is that the hook really isn't in there. It's going to pop right out. So somewhere in between those two extremes, about like this, is really the way to mount your hook in your vise. We're going to start the thread now. And I've got this large hook that I showed you how to cramp the, crimp the barb on still. And I'm going to take this fly line, bright orange fly line, which is not the thread we will be using, and show you how to start the thread. Take four turns forward, approximately, and then take a few turns back, five, six turns. And you will see that now the thread is locked over itself. It's not going to slip. I can pull hard on that, and it still stays put. Now, if you do have problems with this step, there are a few things that you might take a look at. One problem is often that you're using very light thread tension, and that will not lock the thread. If you don't use some thread tension, you're going to have trouble getting that to lock. In fact, this is a good time to uh, to practice something that my friend Dave Hughes recommends in a fly tying book that he did. And that is to start your thread and then pull hard enough to actually break your thread. To do that several times so that you get in touch with how easily your thread breaks. It's a, it's a good suggestion because you're always trying to get your thread tight, but you don't want to be breaking your thread. Now with your thread started, you can let your bobbin hang. In this case, of course, I don't have a bobbin. Let your bobbin hang and then lift up the stub end of the thread, get your scissors in there, and cut it closely. 
That's how you start the thread on the hook. Start the thread. Start it up maybe an eighth of an inch behind the eye. And wrap back until you have locked the thread in. Snip the end of the thread. Spiral the thread back to about the bend of the hook. Now be careful as you wrap to dodge the sharp point of the hook. If you, if you hit that with a thread, you may weaken the fly or you may break the thread altogether. And when you wrap thread, wrap it away from you over the top of the hook and towards you underneath the hook. Away over the top, towards you underneath. Let your bobbin hang. The weight of the bobbin will keep everything tight. Take some lead, fine to medium lead. Bring it down on top of the hook. If you're a right-hander, you'll have your left hand towards you and your right hand away from you. Hold that end close to the hook and start it just maybe a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch up from the bend. That is the point where the straight shank meets the curve of the bend. Bring it down, wrap in close consecutive turns up the shank. And we want to leave plenty of room behind the eye of the hook. Now you have a couple of choices here, actually three choices. One is you can take your standard fly tying scissors, reach in with the insides of the blades. You don't want to use the tips because you want to preserve the sharpness of the tips. And you can snip the lead. Or you can take old fly tying scissors, ones that you're not worried about, or cheap ones, and reach in and cut with the tips. The other thing you can do with lead is you can just hold the lead and pull on it till it breaks. This will stretch it a bit and it'll lay down nicely. If the ends of the lead are sticking up at all, this can cause a problem when you tie the rest of the fly. Get in with your fingernails or thumbnails and press down the ends of the lead. Now you notice that the lead stops well short of the eye. That's important. You need that space clear. Get your bobbin in close. It always is easier to work with a close bobbin than one that's far away. This way, you're making small orbits of the hook. It's much more efficient and faster, and you have more control. Build up a bunch of tight thread at the rear of the lead. This is to anchor this end of the lead in position. Now take a steep angle up the lead and wrap over, the, over it to the front of the lid. Don't use a low angle, don't use a slight angle, because what will happen is your thread will keep stalling between these turns of lead. So keep a steep angle on your thread and just zip it right up to the front of the lid. Take a number of tight turns up here in front of the lid, again, to anchor it. Now when you wrap over that lead and the tying of the fly, the lead won't spread out over the hook and get you into trouble. Angle the thread sharply and wrap it back again to the bend. And you can even go down the bend a little bit on this fly, past the end of the straight shank. Now we're going to dub. This is a technique it has been around for a long time. It is used constantly in fly tying. If you do it the wrong way, you'll find it's very frustrating to try to do. If you do it this way, you'll find it very easy. Your thread is probably pre-waxed. But sometimes it really does help a little bit to add some additional wax. This is called dubbing wax. Don't add it too heavily. Just a little bit. You can use a soft wax or a hard wax as you choose. And we're going to take this bright green dubbing material. Dubbing, of course, can be natural, such as fur, or it can be synthetic. Now in the Rick's Caddis, at least this version of it, we use this bright green because that imitates the Ryacophila, which you don't need to remember that if you don't want to. It's just one specific caddis fly that is very bright. You could use natural if you wanted, but this is the brightest stuff I know of in a, in a green. By the way, this fly can be tied with all kinds of colors, uh, anything that's a natural caddis color, tan, black, olive, whatever. But this time we're going to tie it the way it was originally tied. Now, remember, these are right-handers instructions. In my left hand, I'm going to cradle the bobbin. 
I'm going to also hold on to the ball of dubbing. Uh, I've got several inches of thread here, as you can see, to add the dubbing to. I'm going to draw a little bit of dubbing off the side of the ball. Hardly any. Most people use way too much dubbing, especially at first, and they get in a lot of trouble. Their flies don't have a natural appearance to them, and they don't hold together, and they don't do much anything properly, actually. So just draw off a tiny bit of dubbing, and then hold it up to the thread, and spin it onto the thread. Spin in one direction only. If you spin one way and then back the other, you're spinning the dubbing on and then back off again. You'll never be able to dub well. Keep spinning on dubbing until you've covered quite a bit of the thread. Four or five inches is about the most amount of thread you ever want to dub because now you've got big orbits that you have to make with your bobbin. If you get them too big, it just seems to take all day to get them on there. Better to add dubbing a couple of times than to do that. Spin that on. And you know, if you want the dubbing to really lay down, put a little dubbing wax on your fingertip or your thumb tip, and you'll find that that really makes this material lay down. Now, there are two ways to get the dubbing started on the hook. One is to slide the dubbing down the thread but let's say that we didn't. Let's say that we've got a little space of thread between the hook and the dubbing. Just wrap forward or back a little bit until the dubbing catches. And just try to time it so that the dubbing catches at the point where you're starting here. Wrap the dubbing forward in consecutive turns. You can build up a little bit to smooth things out here. Now, the thing to remember about dubbing is that this is one of the few materials that as it's wrapped forward, if you need to wrap back for some reason, you can do it, and it won't look bad. With dubbing, you can get away with that. With most things, you can't. And you're trying to just build a fairly smooth, even body, fairly long and slender, and you go about two-thirds, three-quarters of, of, of the way up the hook. Now, if there's extra dubbing still left on the thread, just pull it free and pull it off of the thread. Eventually, as you tie the same fly over and over again, you'll get good at judging how much dubbing you need. And then just add the rest of the bit of dubbing right there. Now we're going to dub again. Again, we add wax to the thread. And you have a choice. You can use a synthetic dubbing, such as this brown poly dubbing. Or you can use a natural dubbing. We'll be using this a lot. This is called hair's mask dubbing. And I can show you a little later where it comes from and, and the various ways to get it. But let's assume for now that you've bought it prepackaged. You take a little bit. Again, you, you hold the bobbin in your left hand, cradle it, hold the ball of dubbing, and then tug a little bit off the side. This time, we're going for a rougher appearance, a fuller appearance. So you can dub the thread a little more roughly and a little more heavily. So you're going to make a fairly short, fairly thick thorax on this fly. Start winding this dubbing on. And wind to just behind the eye. Pull a little bit of that off there, a little too much. And bring your dubbing right up to the eye. Now, you'll notice that we have about a sixteenth of an inch of clear shank behind the eye. We do that so that we have room for what is called a thread head. If you crowd the eye, you're going to have a tough time making a thread head. Now to create the thread head, which is standard on most flies, start by stroking back the fur from the eye, leaving that little bit of bare shank exposed. A little bit of moisture on your fingertips can help do this, train that fur out of the way. And then build up a few turns of thread. What you're trying to do is create a tapered head that's very small at the eye and tapers to larger towards the uh, front of the thorax. By the way, that's the front of a fly. That's the back or the rearward part of the fly. Fronts to the eye, backs to the rear. Take a few turns, 
build up that tapered thread head, kind of a cone-shaped thread head. And then with the thread at the back part of the head, we're going to make a half hitch. In fact, we're going to make three half hitches to secure this fly. This is a knot that is very simple. It just looks difficult. Trust me, it's simple. I'll make it clear. To make the half hitch, bring the bobbin towards you so the thread is now parallel with the floor and it's coming from the fly straight to you. With your right hand, separate your first and second fingers and get them well separated. If they're too close together, you'll have problems later. Throughout this, keep them well separated. Bring them straight down on top of the thread uh, so that their tips meet the thread. Bring the bobbin up. Now, rotate your wrist so your fingers go up as you bring the bobbin to the left. The result is that you now have a loop and the thread will cross itself in an X. All you have to do now is to take that side of the loop that's coming from your first finger and hook it over the eye of the hook. Now, let go of the bobbin. Its weight will support the thread. Take your first finger of your left hand, and again, these are right-handers instructions. Reach it in between your first and second finger on the other hand, and then take those fingers out. With your right hand, pick up something pointed. Your scissors are fine if the blades are smooth on the outside. A hat pin would be fine, a needle, whatever, a bodkin, and slide that inside the loop and take the loop away from the first finger of your left hand. Now pull on the bobbin to draw that closed, to draw that loop closed and finish off the half hitch. When you get this object down to the hook, then just slide it out of the loop, give the loop a tug and make it tight. Add another half hitch, same thing, fingers down, bring it up, fingers tip up, hook the loop over the eye, switch hands with the loop, and then put the object in the loop and close the loop. Now let us assume that you've made three half hitches, which is what I recommend. Pull down on your thread, put it under a little bit of tension, reach your scissor tips, put the very tips right up in there, cut your thread. The only thing you have remaining to do now is to add head cement to that thread head. That's so that the thread head doesn't work itself loose and come, un come unraveled. You take some epoxy glue. This is what I use. You can also buy um, head cement in little bottles. And all you have to do is open the bottle, dip something in there, and put some head cement on the fly. But I like the epoxy. I like it because, for one thing, the epoxy glue has no fumes, so I don't have to be breathing some kind of chemical fumes. And the other thing is that it holds like crazy. It's just tougher than nails. Put a little bit of that onto a piece of paper or anything you want, old magazine or TV guide or something like that, and then an equal amount of the other component. There's an A component and a B component. Now, take a pointed toothpick. This is the round kind with a sharp point. And you mix those together. Mix them thoroughly. Make sure you get all the epoxy up here and mixed into the batch. Next, wipe off most of that epoxy. Take the very t pointed tip of that toothpick, dip it in the epoxy. Now bring it up here and add that to the thread head, and then work it around the thread head. And that is how you cement the head. Now this can be tricky when you're just